Yes. How did you transition from, hey, I'm an accountant, hey, I'm going to start some software or create some software. And now like it's a $1 billion plus uh, unicorn, as they call it. Yeah. So how did you get into yeah. that transition? Well, I, I think I'm kind of a, a weird mix of like risk-taking entrepreneur, but also an accountant at the same time. So I, I sort of got here, I would say I, I grew up this way. It's through my parents. So I'm a my, my mom is an accountant and runs a bookkeeping firm and provides business consulting for small businesses and family offices in Los Angeles. My dad is a tax attorney turned author who writes a writes the book on incredibly boring taxation law, but ends up, you know, has moved into entrepreneurship from there. So both of my parents kind of took this accounting tax background and became entrepreneurs with it. So, um, and then one of the things I got into in high school was it was the late nineties, every every tech company was going public. That was kind of like, oh, the stock market's a really interesting thing and learning about companies like Yahoo and, and so on and so forth. And uh, so then I was like, okay, I know I want to start my own company one day and I want to take it public. That would be amazing. So that was sort of, that's been my goal for a really long time. And I've always been very, very entrepreneurial. So through another you know facet of other areas. Um, and then when I got to college, I actually went for film. So I wasn't, I went I went to go to school for film, completely, obviously unrelated, and ended up uh, finding the business program, taking accounting. I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at this. It's pretty interesting. And so I ended up majoring in accounting. And here we are today. Um, you know, I took the natural career path, which is you go to a big four audit firm. You work there for a few years, you get your CPA license. And then I moved out. And when I moved out of audit, I was like, all right, I really want to get to a pre-IPO company to see what that looks like from behind the scenes. And so I, I was very focused on that. And in LA at the time, not the easiest thing in the world, but I found a company called Cornerstone On Demand. This was in 2009. And they were about, a, they had just taken on their first round of venture funding. We're about to go public. They said 12 to 18 months was the timeline they gave me. So I, I loved it. It was, I was the 95th employee at the company, the fifth person in accounting helped scale that up. And I was there for three years and um, going public, growing the team to about 60, 60 people on the finance team. It was just like this great learning experience, but that was where I was like, wow, the month end close is a huge pain in the ass. And there's actually an opportunity here. Maybe I'll go and start a company to solve this problem. And so it, it was wonderful that my degree in accounting actually became useful in my entrepreneurial journey mm. as well. I, I happened to find a pain point that was within the world I was operating in. That was great. Like 10 years ago, if you asked me, you're going to you say, hey, you're going to start an accounting company one day and you're going to love it. I'd be like, no, nah, come, come on. That sounds ridiculous. But it, it is and I love it. And it's uh, it's great. It's been a lot of fun. You know, what's interesting about that is that like it wasn't created on a whim, you know, like you've been planning this, thinking about this, like you took steps um, to work in a company that was going to list on the stock market. Um, you've had intention. What's, what's kind of funny is that, you know, you kind of tried to buck the trend with your parents by saying, well, you're in accounting, I'm gonna go into art. And then somehow you got pulled back into art and now, oh, sorry, you got pulled back into accounting. And now you're in kind of the business side of things, which is very creative. Right. And like, there's a lot of creativity, which is really interesting because you think counting software in the B2B space for the month end close, but literally that's one part, but there's so much creative freedom um, yeah. in scaling a startup, right? Well, starting a business is like, is close to a blank slate. It's a, it's a, a canvas and go figure out what you want to, what you want to build from here. And yeah, it's, it's to me, incredibly creative. And I did realize if I went into film, I probably would have ended up as like a producer, the person who was raising money, getting the idea off the ground <laughs> and then kind of hiring directors and whatnot from there. So I, I did realize that business is probably the better uh, area for me. Not so much the, uh, yeah, the true creative details of it so anyway well coming from an accounting family that's entrepreneurial like i'm sure your parents are very proud right now because now you've found the way to scale up an accounting company to the probably you know one of the largest accounting kind of software like companies in the world right like you know it's not easy to build a company to 1.2 billion dollars right like across any mm -hmm. space right and accounting software like who would have thought right so yep. that's awesome um but you took the plunge, right? So you started the company, right? You know, so what was the first 12 to 24 months like, you know, in starting this kind of venture? So I, um, I had the idea and I was still working full time. I had gotten a small option grant when we went, uh, when I joined Cornerstone. And so as part of that, and I, I'd say the numbers, no problem. I had $25,000 in the bank and I was like, okay, 
It's on Crunchbase, realized, by the way, as well. Yeah. <laughs> my uh, my savings account. <laughs> Listen out there. Here's what you got. Yeah. So, so I was like, okay, I have a little bit of money. I think this idea is really good. The problem is a huge pain for us, and I don't see anyone really solving the problem. And so I decided to actually just just quit. And it wasn't like a side hustle or a nighttime thing or anything. It was, all right, you have twenty five thousand dollars in the bank. And you have no job now, get after it and go figure it out. And that was, that is a great catalyst, man. It, it lit a fire under me. And step one was, all right, I have no product. I have to figure out how to build a product. So do I raise money or do I find a founder or, or you know, what do I do? So I just started talking to all kinds of people. And the first uh, introduction I got was to a, a startup accelerator here in LA by the name of Amplify LA. And I, I had a really good connection to one of them, kind of weaseled my way into an introduction and had lunch with them. And the guy was like, great idea. You know, we'd love to invest in some more SaaS companies in LA. We, your background's perfect for this, but like literally he goes, dude, you need a co-founder, a product and a customer before I can like even talk to you about this. So I was like, okay, how do you do that? He's like, well, go find a co-founder and get them to build it for free. I'm like, okay, I'll go do that. And so, um, went on and this might, this is one of the more ridiculous stories of the, the journey here. So the only engineers I knew in the Los Angeles area were out of Cornerstone and I was not about to poach out of Cornerstone because I'm not looking to burn bridges in a pretty small tech scene like that early on in the journey of the company. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to be recruiting from there. So how can I figure this out? And I stumbled across this website called cofounderlab.com, which is literally like match.com. It's like a dating website for entrepreneurs. So I posted my profile as I'm this business development guy who's looking to start a company. And I start scouring the profiles of a bunch of tech people who like basically sit on a throne and are like, I build software. All of you people who want to start your own company, like come pitch your ideas to me and I will accept or reject them. So it's almost like the earliest stage venture pitch is really with CTO candidates. And so um, it's very much like raising money. You know, I went out, I was looking through profiles. I found like 40 people in LA who I thought would be a good fit, started whittling down the list, had lunches and met with them and all this kind of stuff. And at the, the bottom of my funnel popped out my co-founder, Colin Zanstra, who's our CTO. Um, great background. I love working with him. It's been awesome working with him for the last eight years. You know, who knows coming off one of those websites, what kind of relationship you're, you're getting yourself into with such a, a big one, but it's been amazing working with him. It worked out really, really well. And it was tough in LA because we're, we're in a cool market. There are a lot of cool opportunities out there, you know, and I'm out there pitching some boring accounting, you know, collaboration software. And, but he came out of MySpace where he saw the demise of MySpace, as he puts it, when Facebook came on the scene and he was just like, I want nothing to do with consumer. I want to do enterprise software. Like people pay us money for the software that we write. That sounds amazing. I'm like, yep, that's great. And so, um, so yeah, he hopped on board and it's been great uh, ever since then. And then once I got him to build the product, my mom bought the software. And then I went back to Amplify and I was like, hey, I got a co-founder, a product and a customer. You know, you said you'd let me in. And so all of that kind of played together. And then I went back, I put the suit on, I pitched them and uh, we got into Amplify from there. And then our, uh, our third co-founder, Chris Slutty, who I've actually known him since college. He's also an accountant and like in college, he was always like, Hey man, when you start your first company, like, let me know. I want to, I want to be involved in it. And then fortunately it was accounting based. So his background is like perfect for what we're doing. So that's our, those are the co-founders myself, our CTO, Colin Zanstra, and then our chief product officer now, uh, Chris Ludi. And we, we put that product out and I was trying to sell it. I was trying to raise more money. We were struggling from all kinds of different angles and, um, the big, big, big decision we made, and it was really tough, was we ultimately decided to scrap the entire first product that we had built and built a whole new one from the, from the ground up. We thought we had a better approach. We learned a lot with the first version and we were about to close our seed round right around the time we made that decision. I actually had like verbal commitments for uh, 1.3 million before, and we were in the middle of like, no, we need to get rid of the software. And so um, our first lead investor was a fund called Toba Capital. And we had worked with them a ton. I, like I said, they were they giving me the verbal, they were giving us money. And I called them up and was like, hey guys, definitely don't want to start our relationship off on the wrong foot. So I want to be fully transparent. I've gotten enough no's on selling now where we're going to scrap the software and build a new version of it. And if you want to pull the term sheet, like I completely understand because that's not the bill of goods you've been sold here. So just want to be honest with you. And they were like, no, we really appreciate that. And we think it's the right decision. So we'd love to make the investment and let's go forward and let's build the new version. And it was, it was great. So that, that was like one of, 
arguably the biggest moment in Flowcast history was changing the actual software we built, rewriting all the code, building it up. And that was the product that we took to market in Q1 2015 and have been selling ever, ever since then. So yeah, that first 18 months or two years, a lot of figuring stuff out back and forth. Um, and it all worked out though.